over the past couple of years, I've come to be good friends with a Jewish young adult who was dealing with some struggles in his life. But we have great conversations whenever I'm with him. And he has all kinds of questions about faith and spirituality. And I remember one time when I was there, he had a question for me. He said, I know you Christians, you believe in Jesus, yes. And you follow him, you find him attractive, uh, somebody good? Well, yes. He said, well, I, I, I'm, I'm confused then. Because he had seen the inside of a, of a Catholic church, and in his mind he thought, well, if this is somebody we look up to and attracted, that they'd have this big, beautiful picture of him over the altar. And, of course, what he saw over the altar was Jesus anguishing and dying on a cross. And from his background, now, he said, what's that all about? Why that? That doesn't seem to make sense. I'll come back to that in a moment, but I thought of his question uh, when uh, I was reflecting on the scriptures this week, especially the second reading. And it's part of the whole Lenten reflection, you know, that we proclaim Christ crucified. Whoa, what about that? That, and for uh, this fellow, uh, and maybe for us at times, yeah, is, is, is that the central image of our faith? It, it, it seems desolate and, and it can seem empty. And of course I shared with him, I said, understandably why you see it that way. On the other hand, there's a whole way that uh, when we come to that Christian faith, we look at that from a very different and significant perspective. And of course, he wanted to know more about that. And I said, well, for starters, we believe Jesus came to earth from his heavenly father, and he came, and I make this point because we all sometimes forget it, he didn't come to earth from his heavenly father just to die. He came to earth to show the father's love for all humanity, and that love, wherever it took him, if it made him more vulnerable, if it made him open to rejection and hurt, if, if it ended up by loving, and, and, and no matter what, he was rejected, betrayed, denied, and going to a cross, he continued to love anyway. And again, trying to show us, then and now, in our own reflection, that that's the kind of loving God we have. This, this last week, uh, last Wednesday, uh, all the parishes in the diocese, and we told you about this last week, had three hours of confessions that uh, people could come at any time, either behind the screen or face to face, and, 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 and make it special. And I know that uh, uh, there were people who came in, I'm not gonna tell anybody's confession, so don't worry, but uh, there were people who came in and even would say, I haven't been in confession in many years, the Lord can't possibly want to forgive me. Or somebody else may say, this is what I did in my life, and, and, and I'm here, uh, but I know this has got to be so bad that the Lord can't forgive. And of course, making the point there, going back to Christ crucified, hey, Jesus Christ was spit upon, was rejected, denied all of that on the cross, and yeah, he had his moments of agony. My father, why have you abandoned me? But in the end, he said, Father, forgive them. And the reality is, he forgave all those people who were putting him to death. He certainly can forgive for each of us whatever we might have done that we've never said to anybody or that we maybe in confession would, oh, the priest would probably yell at me, no, no. And, and I probably mentioned this before, Pope Francis says often, Jesus never tires of forgiving us. He's always, we might all, oh, but I keep coming back with the same thing. He's always ready to forgive us. His love, his grace is greater than our sin. And to believe that and to trust that. And that that was what was revealed on the cross for them and for us. And just sharing with this young man that kind of love. <clears throat> and I also made the point that uh, he not only showed how much God loves us, but on the cross he showed us, and this is more difficult, how we're called to love. What we're called to be about. Hopefully never having to go to a, cross, uh, to a cross like that, but we all probably have moments when love is difficult, when love hurts. Anybody in a family, whether it's a family member you see going through a lot that you love deeply, you're gonna be vulnerable, you're gonna hurt. 
But I know, hopefully, just about all of us continue to love anyway and take the hurt and realize that somehow the hurt and the suffering is lifted up by the love that's in the midst of all of that. That's the measure of the cross. And, and so, uh, again, for, for each of us, we can look and say, yeah, how am I doing in this Lenten season when we're called to follow the path of sacrificial love? Not because our God or Jesus wants us to be masochists, but because our God wants us to love and to see. The greatest hope and joy and meaning in our life is when we get out of ourselves and love, even when it's demanding. And I remember uh, uh, this, this the Jewish fellow saying, well, but still, yeah, that love is great, but Jesus died. You know, it looks like love was defeated. And again, sharing with him a little bit, he didn't have the background. Well, no, we believe that uh, <clears throat> Jesus rose from the dead. And in the end, sin and violence and hatred did not have the final say. God's redeeming love did. And that's a message not just for Jesus 2,000 years ago, but for all of us, especially in the culture we're in now. To know, is there evil, is there hate? Yes. <clears throat> but it doesn't have the final say. And just talking and sharing that with this, this young man who was so open to that spirit and how much that meant for both of us. And so, but then the other question, how could Jesus do all of that when, when he was brought down? How could he be lifted up? Well, one, he hoped in that resurrected life, but also he had a deep zeal for following his father's will and sharing his father's love. <clears throat> we see that in the, in the gospel today, that Jesus in the temple, we see him. He's pretty upset. We'd say, whoa, he's so angry. <clears throat> Excuse me. But he had zeal for his father's house. He was mad because in that temple, there were people, business people, who were uh, selling uh, money changers and selling animals for sacrifice. And, and in there, they could care less about it being a house of prayer. Their only concern was uh, to make money and, and, and to be able to achieve greater success and wealth for themselves. Obviously, Jesus, who loved his heavenly father, who loved the temple as a house of prayer, was very angry. And what he did, we need to understand, he comes out of the prophetic tradition of the Old Testament. Old Testament prophets would often make a strong, symbolic gesture to try to get people's attention and say, see, you're not doing the Father's will, that's what we're called to do. And that's what he did there. Maybe hard to understand when you look at what he did, turning over the, top, the, the tables and everything, but he did it out of love. He did it out of hopefully helping these merchants and the others there to see how far astray they were from keeping the Lord at the center of their life. They were more devoted to making whatever money they could, often ripping off people, than they were devoted to the Lord. And so he made a strong point, and maybe hopefully, we don't know, somebody that day may have been touched by that and saw what he was trying to convey. But Jesus had great zeal. He was devoted to his heavenly Father all his life. Again, wherever it took him. And so for us, for starters, we need to appreciate when we come here. We need to appreciate how deeply the Lord Jesus Christ is devoted to each of us right here and now and in our daily lives. This Jesus wants to be in a close relationship with us. This Jesus wants us to know that he's always there for us and with us, to trust that and find strength in that, even in the struggles of life. And, and so deeply devoted. And for us, maybe be more prayerfully aware of his deep devotion to us, of how he gives his very body and blood to us to feed our deepest hunger for a love that is ultimately everlasting. And maybe a part of our response can be from that awareness to be more deeply devoted to God. To come here and when we come to Eucharist and, when, and in our daily lives, to, uh, wow, to be able to pray every day and say, Lord, I am devoted to you. I'm so awestruck by your love. You're always there for me. And yeah, we're going to have our ups and downs, but to come back to that and to realize, and to, and to realize the greatest joy and hope and meaning of our lives is when we're devoted, ultimately devoted to our God. 
What other greater mission could we have? And then obviously this God says to us, yes, you're devoted to me, now with me and through me to be devoted to the people in your life. We all know, family, parents, work, we can take each other for granted. But the greatest thing we can do, devoted to the God who's there for us, and then having that same kind of devotion for the people in our lives, that maybe through that, we help them see what our God is all about. We help them see God's goodness for them. We help them maybe know from our own sharing, this God forgives anything and everything. So right now, let's just take a moment and, and, and kind of check our devotion uh, level. How devoted are we to our God? How devoted are we to the people in our lives? Really devoted, willing to give our lives daily for them. And where is the Lord at this liturgy saying to us, take a moment, listen to me, and see where you're called to grow, to be that devoted human being that is so alive in Christ, and life is so vital through that, because we love, at least working toward this, love without limit. Take a quiet moment and see what the Spirit is saying in your hearts and in my heart. God bless you.